Hi everyone, it is, oh, weirdly enough, 3.33 a.m. 7.17.21, I guess. Uh, <laughs> don't read too much into that time, that was, <laughs> uh, that was pretty weird. Anyways, uh, making this because I know I mention pretty often, um, how to do a word search. So if you're going to do a word study, um, there's a few ways that you want to go about it to try to um, at least use the tools that are available to do your best to get to uh, the most likely meaning and use of a word. Of course, y you do have to keep in mind, uh, there are some limitations. Even if you're going to do a very exhaustive, uh, deep word search, there are limitations. The limitations include what manuscripts are available in what softwares. Um, there's going to be limitations in what I'm telling you here because I only use certain tools. Um, there might be, <coughs> excuse me, there might be more and better tools out there. <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot of different Bible software tools. So, you know, if any of you, you find a better tool and you can do these kind of things a lot better with these other tools, then let me know. Uh, in the comments or, you know, you can send me an email. You can find the Obrey Project email on my website, so on and so forth. Okay, so there's other limitations. And it's good if we go over the limitations first, so you can keep these in mind. Um, the other limitations are this. So, I have on the screen right now the, the basic tools that I would usually use uh, to do a word search. Actually, I have to bring up one more thing in, um, sorry, in Acrobat Reader. Uh, Acrobat Reader is one of the tools I use all the time to do a lot of stuff. Um, Acrobat Reader is um, a software from Adobe that you can't just buy outright. Adobe doesn't want to sell anything of theirs anymore, like license anything of theirs anymore. They want to license it all month to month. Um, and that's like everything in Adobe. So, you know, people who are graphic designers, they just license them. It's got pluses, and you know. Uh, the pluses are, for instance, when I was a graphic designer and I went to school for graphic design and I worked in the field, um, a company would have to buy a lot of maybe Adobe, uh, Macromedia. Uh, this was the time when Quark Express was used real commonly as a layout program. And, you know, they would just have to buy the newest version in the newest version of an Adobe product could, you know, I don't know, cost hundreds of dollars. And in the next year, they would have a newer version. And, um, you know, if you wanted to stay really cutting edge and you really needed to have that new tool that they included in the new version, well, you'd have to license the new version. Okay. Um, so the clouds are, I guess, good because, you know, you get updates. You know, whenever they happen, you get updates. I suppose it's good for that. Um, the 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 bad thing about that is you don't have an actual physical copy that you own on, on a disc or a flash drive or whatever, and that's my copy, and I can do with it what I want, when I want, how I want. Um, it's a give and take. But anyways, so th this is one of the things that... Um, I spend the money that is sent to me by those generous uh, donators, supporters, is on things like these tools and the website and so on and so forth. Even the uh, the tool I'm using to record this, Screencast-O-Matic, I have to pay a an annual subscription for that. So it all goes to very good use. Um, anyways, and, and usually... There's not a lot that, that send. The people who do are, are actually very, have been really faithful for, for quite some time, but it mostly just, you know, pays for these things. Um, and actually there's a, a book fund for self-publishing 
when I get that book done, but um, you guys have to understand something. I've been working on that, the geography book, for years. For years. Um, the problem is this. I could do it one of a couple ways. I could, the first way I could do it is I could, uh, I could do it all based mostly on the translations we've got and mostly based on um, Hebrew or uh, Greek, even Latin uh, understandings of those translations. I could do that. If I did that, um, well, let's say this. I was doing it that way because there's um, yeah, anybody who could try at any time to claim that, well, it's it's his it's his uh, weird method of using obery, and it, it's it's not all that complex when I explain to you what obery is and how it works. It's it's quite simple. It's just the language. Um, based on characters that, that anyone can find through some diligent searching, the, the way that they used to look before they were turned into an Assyrian block script. Um, and it's without the Mazora, and it is using uh, the common Western sounds to vowels and consonants um, that you can mostly find expressed in Germanic languages. And um, the root words, they're all there if you use a, a simple online etymology dictionary uh, and start searching the roots in these words, you'll find them in Germanic, in uh, Scandinavian, um, in Dutch, in English, in what they call Proto-Indo-European, and you'll even find them in, in Greek and Latin because it would appear that at some point in time a number of uh, Obri words were transliterated and then incorporated in, in some sort of permanence in what we call Greek and Latin. So, you know, there's nothing esoteric uh, about Obri whatsoever. It, it's simply the, a far more pure expression of the language that the Bible was actually written in than what we use today called Hebrew. So, um, the method. All right. One of the things is this. The documents that I have, or the, the tools that I have, that are freely available. Um, some of the tools I have, they're available just in PDFs. And um, as some of you might know, I, I've tried to turn some of these, like, for instance, there is the, uh, I'll go back to LibreOffice, there's the uh, Exhaustive Obri Biglyphs Roots Chart. This is not a finished chart, it's a work in progress, because it's going to take a very long time to fill all of it in, um, to make it complete, and, and who knows how long. And what I do is I actually fill this table in, it's uh, not a chart, it's a table, I fill this table in as I go in my Obri translation, which I am currently in Genesis, and it's taken a really long time. Um, but I know, I'm sorry, I started on the, the book. So I could either, um, I could either finish the book, like go through and finish these points and chapters based on our understanding of the Bible through a, a lens of the Masoretic Hebrew through the lens of, of Koine Greek, the Septuagint is in Koine Greek, or, or Latin Vulgate. The problem is that um, for the last year or two, I've noticed on a lot of key points that um, and maybe I would get a chapter written and I would be, I'd be pretty pleased with it. Because you can see a lot of the problems in the geography comparison between Palestine and what the Bible actually says. You can see that very clearly if you just stuck with English. You could see it. Um, so let's say I would get a chapter done. 
and I would be going back through it. And I would be checking my terms just to make sure everything was, was spot on. And I would start seeing um, anomalies. I would start seeing anomalies in the text. I would start um, seeing anomalous words and phrases, maybe say around a key word that I was using in that chapter to prove something. So I would have to go back and I would have to study those things out. And a lot of times in doing so, that actually gave birth to a number of the presentations and ideas I've talked about in the meantime. When I say I've been writing the book for a couple of years, I've been writing the book since far, far before I got chemo. I started on the ideas of it as, as early as doing the, um, the, the first early presentation I did, The Patriarchs, Their Livestock, and the Land, which I've recently updated, revised, rewritten, and will be re-releasing pretty soon because it's, it's very different than it once was. So that's a long time. And, uh, and trust me, it, it isn't a, a matter of dragging my feet. It's, it's literally a matter of, um, I don't have deadline pressures from a publisher. I don't think I ever will. <laughs> um, and it has to be done right. And, um, if you're going to do something, do it right the first time. And then it'll last, I, to, to the best of your ability and the best of your knowledge. And that's why it takes so long. Right now I'm working on a concept in the geography book. It's, it's having to do with the directions or how we understand directions, north, south, east, and west. Because I had to have a chapter on north, south, east, and west. There's a lot of words in the Bible that are translated as those cardinal directions. And they have to be looked at uh, to see whether they actually mean north, south, east, and west. And um, as I spent more and more time looking at them, I started seeing a lot of problems that I had to address. You know, and one of the ways that you have to address these things is by doing these sorts of, of word studies. So yeah, I do have these tools available. I, I try to export them so I can publish them as a PDF because most people have the ability to open and work with a PDF even if it's in uh, your browser. You know, a lot of browsers will open and read PDFs. You can just open it in a browser and, and work, work with it in a browser. That's great. You don't need Acrobat Reader just to, to do that. The problem I'm having is that um, when when you choose export in LibreOffice, for some reason, all of the bookmarks that I put in these documents to make them easier to navigate, they're they're not coming out right when I export these into a PDF. And I, I didn't realize this for a long time. So that could be the case here in the document that's the Strong's Obery words. Uh, I know it's definitely the, uh, the case in the exhaustive Obery Byglyphs Roots table. And that's what's caused me to not keep publishing it weekly because I change that table just about weekly. Not change, alter, but um, fill in more cells in the table, get better information because it is a work in progress and I do get more and better information week by week or day by day. So the reason that um, all of these bookmarks or indexes, cross-references, cross-references are in these documents, they're, they're big documents. Okay, the, um, the uh, Strong's Obery word list is 59 pages. The exhaustive Obery Byglyphs Roots table is 148 pages. Um, I've also put up at the website uh, PDFs of the uh, Obery Old Testament in the Masoretic, uh, Masoretico Critical, and also in the, um, I want to say, in oh, now I forgot, in the Micriot uh, Getalot. Let me see. 
can find out real quick. So I have uh, two versions that I've put up at the the website. Um, oh yeah, the Westminster uh, Westminster Leningrad Codex. So th those two different versions. Now I use a lot of times when I'm I'm doing these word studies and searches and figuring trying to figure things out. Oftentimes I use the Masoretico Critical, the MC, because of eSword. Now eSword is the, the software I use most often to do Bible study because it's really, I think it's loaded with, with pretty good tools and um, actions that you can perform. Um, there are a lot of different manuscripts available that you can get for eSword. Okay, if you just get the um, the software and you load it up, one of the things you can get is a module for Bibles called Hebrew OT+. Plus. You can also get Hebrew OT. Now, I use those. Um, be, those you can find when you go to download. There's the uh, the download tab at the top. And you can choose that and you can go, they're free. Okay, so you, you can also go to a website called biblesupport.com. And that's where I got these uh, other modules. They're called HSB, Hebrew Study Bible. Um, I use pretty much HSB 2, 3, and 4. Uh, HSB 2 has, uh, what they'll do is, Maybe I should start with four. Okay, HSB four. Now this is the um, this is all based on the um, Micraeo Gedolo, which is the text that's underlying the King James version. So everything you would find in King James version, chapter and verse, um, you're going to find reflected in the uh, the Micraeo Gedolo or the Hebrew Study Bible. Okay, this module is for, this is only Masoretic Hebrew. And the nice thing is it actually has, if you need to look at and compare what the Masoretes did, as far as the, um, um, really as far as the, 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 the collation that, um, oh, what's his name did? <laughs> Uh, that worked for the press that published it. I mean, the the big names in some of these uh, translations um, are uh, definitely Christian Ginsburg uh, because he did the Masoretico Critical, and and he did a lot of uh, he did a lot of work in the Mazora. Uh, don't trust the guy, please. But uh, him because that was that was a lot more recent and then uh sometime long before him the the micreo getalo was put out it was published by i'm going to get the information on it right here bomberg i am sorry yes it was daniel bomberg um pretty much let's see a, a jewish publisher and it was, let's see, it was collated by a guy, there it is, Yaakov ben Hayim, Hayim, Jacob ben Hayim, or Yaakov, that's who it was, ben Hayim. I really needed to, to remember that or it was going to drive me crazy. So that's what HSB4 is going to show you. HSB3 is going to show you the, the same thing, and yet yeah, they're in this Assyrian block text. But it's also going to give you the Strong's numbers that you can click on. And if you stay on, KJC is really where I stay. Uh, for the, um, the dictionaries module below, you could, you could use the concordances or the, uh, the lexicons. If, if you do so, choose. Um, I don't find them helpful. Um, I stay on KJC because what KJC is going to do, it's going to simply give me uh, the total amount of times um, that a word appears according to them and in, in what form. So I just clicked on uh, H3499 guitar 
And uh, it says it occurs as rest 63 times, remnant 14, residue 8, excellency 3, left 3, <coughs> withs 3, chord 1, exceeding 1, excellent 1, leave 1, more 1, plentifully 1, string 1. Ridiculous. But anyway, so that's that's what will happen. And whenever you get these, uh, the, these strong link numbers in here, you can right-click on them, go to Quick Search, Old Testament, or just the book. In this case, I chose the book, Zephaniah, and look, boom, got the search. Okay, so that version, which is called the Hebrew Study Bible, it exactly matches the King James. So it makes it really easy, you know, to um, to toggle back and forth between KJV+. Plus. KJV+, Plus has the Strong's numbers in it, so you can, you can do the same thing. Um, you can right-click. Say, I want you to show me everything in that book or the Old Testament. And they'll come up and they're highlighted, so they're really easy to reference. Okay? And, and so you know that HSB 3 is going to be almost exactly lined up structurally with the, the King James Version. Now, HSB 2 will actually show you the text along with the uh, Assyrian block script Hebrew and the Strong's numbers uh, with links that you can right click on and, and check out. Now the reason that I, I use the Hebrew Old Testament and Hebrew Old Testament plus modules is because first off it's written in a simple modern Hebrew and it's far easier to look at than that calligraphic Assyrian block text. And I mean that's a big reason. It's smaller. So it doesn't take up as much room on the screen. It's really easy to navigate through. I can just toggle back and forth between Hebrew Old Testament and I can just look at the Hebrew Old Testament by itself. And uh, this is the, uh, the Masoretico critical version. So you would, if you're, if you're really, really, really wanting to read um, English translations of that, you could get English translations of that, feel free. Um, but, you know, are they going to be coded to Strong's in a module for eSword? I don't know. But anyways, there's what I use uh, as far as eSword goes. And I'm going to show you that the way that this can be used. One other thing um, that's important to mention is that I installed on my computer, and you can get it at uh, a website. I don't know if I can tell you what website or not off the top of my head. Um, it's just called Biblical Hebrew SIL, capital S-I-L. That's, it's essentially a font for your, your system, okay? And you can switch back and forth in your system from English to the the Hebrew sill. Now this helps a lot if you're trying to write documents or if you want to let's say use uh, I don't know any sort of website or um, forms online where you want to type Hebrew in uh, it's that's good to have. Um, it also helps, depending on, on certain things that you're doing, uh, to actually have that available. Okay. Now, as far as the the Obri Beta, I think I'm. I know that sounds ridiculous that I can't remember. Is it Obri Beta three or four? I'm gonna have to check real quick. Beta three. Hmm. Okay. Um. I. I can't post that up at the site as a file on my website because the the um, the web host doesn't allow that kind of file just to be posted for download. But anybody who wants this font, I'll send it to them. I created it in a really simple program. It's a true type font. I haven't gotten around to creating another one, and there's a couple of reasons. One, I could do it with the same. Uh, at the same site using the same program, true. Um, but the thing is, I wanted to actually do it correctly. 
the thing is the site that I use to create this font it does have some drawbacks it it doesn't automatically do a great job as far as the leading goes so the space between letters or the the space between words and it can make some things look a little strange you might think you know glyphs look a little too close together or a little bit too far from one another depending so that's that's kind of one not great thing about it so there is a uh, there is an open source software out there called font forge and anybody who would be interested if you have a bit of a, a graphic background or, or if you don't there are still um tutorials on how to use font forge and how to create fonts um that would be interested in making a newer version of um obri let me know and uh, i can tell you how to get that and um where I'm going with these glyphs because this is one of the other limitations um, that I don't really think that the glyphs look precisely like or did look at one time precisely like some of the old examples that we have I think even though we do have a lot of examples of how they once looked which they tend to call paleo Hebrew um, I don't think that they always looked like that. I, I think that because of what artifacts, information, and evidence that we have, uh, the people controlling all of this have had a certain amount of, of free reign as far as fooling around with things. What I essentially believe is that the, uh, the glyphs once looked very much like what are the letters in our English or Germanic alphabets now look like um, the letter that they call Kaf in Masoretic Hebrew it's a K and I think it looked very much like our K does today like an open splayed hand um, the letter that they call Samic you'll see that um, in the Obri Beta 3 it almost looks like a telephone pole because those were the best examples I could find in the materials within a, where I was looking. You have to remember that l that glyph is not used as often as a lot of others. So there was probably room to play and misrepresent it. Because I'm not saying that all the artifacts that we're looking at are authentic. Um, for instance, the large rock that they say is in Hezekiah's tunnel underneath what they call Jerusalem over in Palestine. Um, well, first off, I don't believe that's Hezekiah's tunnel because it's described very differently in the Bible than the tunnel that's over below Al-Quds, or what they call Jerusalem. But there's a large inscription using a certain type of old letter. And uh, I just don't believe that a lot of that is authentic, what is known as Paleo-Hebrew or Obri. So S is one of them, um, and you'll notice in Obri Beta 3, the S looks sort of like a telephone pole, whereas I believe that the original S looked a lot like our S does today. And it, it did have a lot to do with meandering, curving, turning, and that's why it looked like our S does today. So there are changes that will have to happen. Um, over time, one of the reasons I haven't done it, first off, I don't have enough time. Um, but another reason is, who knows what I'll think of the way that these uh, glyphs should actually be represented as time goes on. Maybe when I get further and further down the road, I'll decide that they should look nearly exactly like our letters today do. I don't know. So, anyways, it, just so you know about the, the limitations that there are, so that you don't get caught up if you're doing these word studies. Um, as I've said before, I also have at, um, at Archive, you can go to archive.org, and um, I'll just put that in real quick. 
Now you should be able to actually, maybe you can just, maybe you can just punch in obry. Let me see if that comes up. There's, there's a list that I've created, and I actually should have it bookmarked. I don't mean that as in I should. I mean I should. Oh, I I should have <laughs> bookmarked it. Um, let me try this. Um, you know, at this point in time, I'm going to bookmark it because I just had it in my head that I did have it bookmarked. Here we go. Obery Project indexed manuscripts. And there they all are. And it's not bookmarked. That's not funny. So I'm going to bookmark it real quick. I had no idea I hadn't bookmarked it, so I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, let's just throw it in the bookmarks menu, and then I'll I'll get to it later. So in here, um, you can reference about 30 manuscripts. And as you'll see up at the top, I indexed all of them with cross-references. So these cross-references, which are pretty much at the beginning of most of these texts, they will take you to the various books. You can see them here in this, um, this Madrid manuscript. Okay. I haven't taken the time to verse mark these, so you're going to have to be sharp. If you want to search what any given manuscript has um, written for, uh, let's say, a word that you come across that seems uh, strange, out of place, what do these manuscripts say? You could go and you could check any of these manuscripts that have that in there. Now, some of the manuscripts that are like this. This is uh, one of the manuscripts that's it's Leviticus to Deuteronomy. And it's it's Hebrew, but it's it's also a Targum. So this starts right out uh, Leviticus 3. Uh, and what you're going to see is you're going to see the Hebrew first. And it's best if, if you can just download these manuscripts. Um, but you can still look at them in here. You know, you can uh, you can blow them up a little bit. Look at them closer. So what you're going to see is they're going to first give you the Hebrew text, one line of it, so one verse. And then they're going to have a colon. And then they're going to have that same verse, but in what they call Aramaic. Which, here's what I believe Aramaic is. Based on the, the history I understand from the Bible, 2 Kings 17, and the, the Samaritans, that this all comes from Samaritan texts, everything we, we know of as Hebrew, pretty much, um, is that what they call Aramaic, I don't know that that's really the language that the people from Aram spoke, but I think it's actually the language that those people who were brought in by the kings of Assyria and Babel, that it's actually a sort of ad hoc obri. Um, a lot of ad hoc obri terms uh, inserted into the language that before was actually Ashur uh, or Assyrian language that it's basically a kind of a bastardized language. Same with Koine Greek. Um, and I've, I've found more and more that these people are kind of at the, uh, at the root of everything bad that we misunderstand about language, unfortunately. So you can use these to reference. Now, if you're going to try to study a word, it, get to the bottom of what the word actually means. I'll use the um, the Obrey English Genesis that I've been working on. So let's say I'm at Genesis 121. 
And I've already translated the word bara. I've already done alayim, at. Okay, so I get to this word that I haven't done yet. This is a uh, taninim. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this through <clears throat> some some filters using the tools that I have. Um, one of the things that would help is if if you understand what are the likely roots in a word. So this word is most likely a noun with the definite article on it, eh, taninim. So this this could be a, a sort of neutral plural at the end. So you would have tanin, okay? Um, you could look at this, you could break this down and, and look at it in the, um, the exhaustive table. And we'll see if I have it. Ten. Now remember these. Basically, the uh, the Strong's Obrey list and this table. They're better if you use them in LibreOffice than if you try to use the versions that are the PDF exports, because the um, the cross references do not work correctly. You, you'll still get all of the text as I've entered the text in, but you're going to have to manually scroll through. If you have the, the documents, the LibreOffice documents, which I gladly send to anyone who wants them, if you have the LibreOffice documents, then you can navigate through these very easily. So if I just want to look at the root, I go to my table. I've got, uh, I've actually got three entries here at the left for 10, T-N. Uh, one says that it's, it's used 2,009 times for give, put, yield, or recompense. That may be true. It says it's used one time as sea monster, though it's, it occurs as tanim, not tanin. And again, tanim, sea monster. What I just saw there in the text was tanin. So I would actually say a word like tanan is closer than this tanim, just depending. So there's a way that we can, all right, you can go and you can reference the cognate words here on this, um, the exhaustive obrey biglyph roots table. That's one good way. You just look at all of the different cognates that have very similar structures and get an idea of how it's used from those. The other way is, so you open up your Esword and we'll go to Genesis 1 and to verse 21. And here's the word, etaninem. What I'm going to do is I have the, the module Hebrew Old Testament Plus open. I'm going to right click on the Strong's number. And in this case, I want to pick the entire Old Testament because I want to see all of the examples of it. Now, if you get into a really common word, let's say like ba, which is uh, to come or enter, there's going to be a lot of occurrences. In, in some instances, eSword is only going to give you like the first... I think it's somewhere around the first one to maybe 1,500 to 2,000 occurrences of that word. And then it's just going to crap out. It's just going to tell you, you're going to scroll through them. And let's say there were like 4,000 occurrences of that word. I was just pretty insane. But there's other reasons why you might get more occurrences of a word that we're going to see. And unfortunately, it's not going to show you all of them. It's just going to get to so many and then it's going to cut off. But there's other ways to search if you really have a really long search on a word that shows up a lot. There's other ways to, to look at it or to see where it might be. Um, this is just one and this, this one's really effective. So one thing you can do, go to your uh, the verse that say you're working on and find that word in its form. So in this case, I was in Genesis 121 and it is 
it occurs as e, t, n, e, n, m, with those glyphs all together in that order. Now let's say I want to see this word in its context. So I want to see the occurrences of this word when it, it occurs as exactly, um, in, in exactly this form. Select it. Select it from right to left. I think that's a lot easier than trying to go from left to right because you're working in um, this Hebrew font, which it's, it's all entered from right to left instead of left to right. So you can just hit Control C to copy it. Go up to your top left window here, which this is where you would typically type in your Strong's number, or if you were in, um, if you were using an, an English uh, module, you could actually type in an English word. Now here's where this is is cool. Then you just paste that word into the window, and you hit Enter. Now I can see that well, it, it only appears in this form in this one verse. But that's okay, because I know when you have the uh, the E at the front of a noun or a thing, it's the definite article. So I'm going to reduce this a little bit. I'm going to select everything just after the E, copy that, go up, make sure the entire text that's in this box is highlighted so I can do a full replacement. I pasted it in, hit Enter. I found it three times now. Now with those three times, one thing you can do that makes that that makes things easier is once you have the uh, the Hebrew module um, in this search window that's open here, then you can go up here and select a different module. You can select uh, KJV plus, let's say. And you come back in this window, click somewhere that is not in the text or numbers because you don't want anything else to, to come up on you. Just click somewhere in here so this is active. And then just float your cursor over these verses and you're going to get the English translation of these verses as well as being able to look at the Hebrew wording too. And you'll be able to uh, compare any of these words between what it is, at least in English, King James English, and what it is in Hebrew. Okay, so this is Strong's H8577, and every time I'm seeing it, mm -hmm, serpents, and here it says dragons. The, their wine is the poison of dragons, cruel venom. All right. So we can, we can actually modify this down a little more. Say, I'm not worried so much about seeing what may be the, the neutral masculine plural. So I'm just going to copy all of the text before that M suffix at the end. Go up to the top, select, paste that in. Hit enter. Now I have more options. One of the things that I'll do when I get a lot of, of options that'll come up from a, a text grab like that, I'll go through and I'll take a look at the Strong's numbers and see if they're all the same. Ah, oh, look at here. When I get to 1 Kings 2031, this T N Y N Tanin, which is the root once you take away that E at the front, which is the definite article, and the M at the back, which is the, the, the neutral plural. Remember, when I'm telling you what these things are, these are, are pretty much based on accepted rules. That it's not necessarily what they are, even though I've, I've found the E at the front of a noun to actually, and at the front of a verb or an attribute, to be doing that particular thing, uh, what we call the definite article, okay? Oftentimes, when I see the M at the end, it does seem to imply some sort of a neutral plurality. It does. But I just don't want to tell you that that's absolute, because there aren't rules written for this right now that we're aware of. So anyways, I see the T-N-Y-N 
in 1 Kings 20.31 and it's under a different Strong's entry number. And I want to see what. Now they're saying from Matan. Now Matan is translated as loins 42 times, side 4, side 4, greyhound 1. That's an interesting word because that a form of that word actually shows up in um, in the event where Jacob is supposed to be wrestling uh, with with an angel, and there's a lot of strange wording that goes on in there. And um, when you start looking at it and what its potential possibilities are, um, I would think anybody would start wondering if the way that that's translated is is very accurate the same with the um the incident with Jacob and Esau and the supposed red pottage the way that the wording is actually written in there it just certainly doesn't seem like the translation is correct that Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of red pottage or a bowl of anything so anyways, now you, you understand that, okay, I can see this root that's being expressed in this other word. That's interesting. You know, and what's the translation? Um, obviously here, it is, uh, it's 4975. It's being translated as loins. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads. That would be that would be remarkably painful. They tell us that sackcloth is supposed to be burlap, right? The word translated sackcloth is uh, shuck. And I'm not so sure that that's sackcloth whatsoever, because you'll, you'll see shuck in other places. And... Um, Let's say for mourning, if somebody's mourning, they're they're extraordinarily distraught, so they're mourning. It does seem to me a strange thing to put sackcloth, especially on one's loins, to mourn, unless now you're emotionally distraught and you're horrifically uncomfortable because you've essentially put burlap on the tenderest parts of the skin of your body. That doesn't make any sense. I, I don't think these people were particularly, um, you know, your um, misogynists. Because it, it does strike me as misogynistic. So it does come up as 49.75 uh, at least a couple of times. But we could actually refine that. Now, it, it comes up as 85... Back in Genesis, it was 85.77, right? And we see it coming up now as 85.79, which is Aramaic. Um, again, some of the words in Aramaic are actually the same as Hebrew. It should be Arami. You've got Arami and Obery, okay? Uh, some are the same. Some are not. But both of these are in Daniel. The first one they're translating as again. And the um, the second one as second. <laughs> so you can actually, you could reduce this even more. You could gen then go back and say, well, I want to see maybe that N, because sometimes N is a suffix. Sometimes YN is a sort of an odd suffix that um, it's not used very often, but it is still a suffix. You could just select the TNY. And, um, oops, I already went into the, uh, the window too early. Copy that, go in the window, paste that. And now you're going to look at all the words that have this TNY in it, you see? And it's a lot. It's 289. But you can start looking at all of the different words that you see it in. Because this is going to have to give you the exact wording. So it's not like Strong's. Strong's can just decide that such and such word is this. And here's all the occurrences, how it's used. And um, the problem is, 
that you would have to type in to see all of the variations in a word. Let's say, um, and you can see down the lower left hand of my screen, my my computer is actually switched to that Hebrew sil font. So I want to actually go down here, switch it back to English. I'm not saying your computer is going to do that, but it could. I'm going to switch it back to English and let's just see. It's kind of a big one though. But this might give you a really good idea of how many different ways something can appear and it doesn't mean that's necessarily supposed to be the same word. Strong's will consider like this is H935. All right? H935 is typically translated as come came, brought, go, went, cometh, entered, entering, goeth, carried, gone, you get it. But the thing is, it might be, it might occur in a lot of different ways. And those ways may or may not be the same word. We're looking, we're looking at something made up of different glyphs. Now, in some cases, it has um, prefixed and suffixed glyphs because it's working within an entire thought. It's surrounded by other words. So, you look at this example from Genesis 6.20, yi ba u. It's got the y at the front, the u at the end, so we've got a verb leading into the next thought. So the root here is just ba, B-A, to, you know, come, enter. But there are going to be those times when you, when there are prefixes and suffixes. There are times when you're going to see affixed glyphs in there. So you would see maybe a Y or a U between the two principal glyphs making up that simple biglyph root. But there are going to be times when, for instance, Genesis 10.19, they have bake, B-A-K-E. That does not really follow as far as it being the same word. Um, and there's some reasons for that. Uh... It doesn't really follow to have the K at the end because that would typically be one person speaking to another and signifying you or your if it had the K at the end. Um, so we're looking at possibly a different word here because this is just third person, this Genesis 10.19. In English it says, "In the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon as thou comest to Gerar unto Gaza. Now, this is a verb, and they're trying to tell us that bake is, um, in this case, 935 comest. The problem is it's far different than all of the other forms of ba, uh, to come, to enter, to bring. So that's important. But I want you to see the difference between using a Strong's number and actually selecting the text and putting that in and seeing what comes up. So we'll take that. I just copied bake and put it in. Now in this case, it always occurs as H935. But if I just selected the first three glyphs, copied, paste, I get a lot more that comes up. Um, we still have it as 938 or 935 in a number of instances, but what else? We have it appearing as 938 in book. Well, it's Baakal Nu um, taking, eating. Uh, let's see. That's one problem is that B is um, a prefix that tends to 
signify in, with, or near. So you always have to be on the lookout for that. If, if you get to one, and for instance, it's like H398, which the root is akal, and you have it right here, you, you just have to be kind of on your guard. Because ba akal, with, near, taking, uh, or consuming. So you got to be a little bit careful about that. If you don't find a lot of decent, what do I got here? And we're back to 935 again. If you don't find a lot of, of decent cognates that actually help you, try to figure the word out a little bit better. You can go back and just select a different aspect of the word, like the last three glyphs, A-C-E, paste those in, A-K-E. I said C because in um, this more modern Hebrew script, it looks more like a C than a K. Sorry about that. So I end up seeing a lot of Malake uh, Messenger. Uh, let's see. Mostly that, $43.99. I know I got off the Tanin thing, but I'm just basically showing you how this works. And it can work just brilliantly at giving you all of the forms of a word. Um, sometimes you might not get a lot of different forms of a word that, that you were hoping to see. Um, okay, so for instance, smote. It's listed as na ke to smite. And, strangely enough, its root could actually be Ke. All right, so ke. You could go back to the um, the exhaustive Obri biglyph roots table. Go to ke. Um, now it's translated as thus so also, but ku smote strike or slay. A lot of times when you get to um, simple biglyph roots with a vowel. Sometimes, especially I've noticed with E and U, those vowels tend to a lot of times seem like they can be interchangeable. I think the way that a vowel affects any glyph is a little bit different than the way a consonantal glyph has its effects. And then you have to remember... uh if you if you have two glyphs in a in a biglyph root and you have a vowel and a consonant the meaning of the word is usually far more concentrated on the consonant than the vowel just because they are different i don't know exactly how the vowels work but they're not the same sort of concepts that we're looking at when we're looking at consonants so Anyways, there's I, I'm I'm gonna stop it here because it's it's been an hour. Uh, there is a way for you to do these word searches now. Real quick, if you have uh, let's say these these documents that are the uh, the Obrey Old Testament, either the MC or the Westminster Leningrad Codex. I have both of those published on the resources page at the site. You can open these up. Um, in uh, a browser window or whatever, you can hit Control F. Now the same thing happens here in Acrobat that would happen in a browser window. You're going to get a search screen that opens up, and I better get back to English again. All right. And if you just reference the Strong's list, the Strong's list shows you in the fourth um, column what the keyboard keys are for these glyphs. Okay, just so you know that, for instance, when you want to hit the uh, the th glyph, you're going to hit the T. But when you want to hit the t, t, ta glyph, you're going to hit the I. Now, most of them actually are um, synchronized with their 
Germanic English counterpart letters. So most of them are the same. But you do have to keep in mind that some of them are different. The Sha is W because it looks most like that. There's just a few of them which had to be altered. The Tsa is X. Most of these are going to be the same though. The Pe is P, the O is O, the S is S, the N is N, the M is M. Okay. So you could search in here if you wanted to, to find a, a particular word. Um, we'll just say Tani. And, and you could refine these searches too. And it will, oops, didn't want Tani. Wanted that Tani. I got Thani. There we go. And it's going to start showing you words that that's in. You can refine your search if you're using um, Acrobat. Uh, and to a certain degree with browsers, you should be able to refine your search too. But that right there is a really good way. Um, and those are really good tools for searching particular words. One last thing. And this is really, really, really good to know. If you're trying to refine your search to say two concepts and we're back in eSword let's say I want to find all the verses that have two words in them because two words together in a you know as a pattern appearing in many places that's important so you want to try to select the um, the root of the word if you're not sure what the root is click on the number and Typically, a lot of times they'll they'll show you the correct root. So let's say in here, we're going with Ammer. So I'm going to select Ammer, copy it, go up to the top left box, paste that in. Now this part is is really important. We're going to put it with Bashuk, and I'm selecting it, copying it. Now when you go up to this box. Click once and everything comes up blue. You do not want to hit paste yet. You want to click the cursor again so that it's not in blue. Don't worry about the fact that the cursor is blinking over here to the left of the word, okay? Just hit the space bar. See, pops it over there. And then hit paste. And there you have the two words together. Now here's what it's going to do. Hit enter. And it's going to give you all of the verses in which those words show up together. And you can compare those verses and you can start seeing if there's a pattern emerging with those words appearing together. Okay. Um, and then there's ways that you can refine searches using LibreOffice documents too. And that's, that's really effective also. So, Anyways, yep, there are some of the tools, uh, some of the methods and techniques that anyone can use to do word searches in, uh, in, in these various programs using these various tools. Um, you can do something very similar to this if you had selected all of this in just King James English, if you wanted to see all of the English words. You could do that. You can do this with Greek. I do this with Koine Greek documents. You can, as far as I know, I'm pretty sure, well, you know, I could do it with Latin as well. Um, the only problem with Latin is I don't have, I don't have a version right now on here that has any sort of Latin coding um, because that would be dictionaries. It's not coded to Strong's or anything like that. So I'm not even sure if that will come up or not. I'm, I'm going to check actually while I'm... All right, let's say Latin. And... Hmm. Give me a sec. Not sure if this will work. But I'm just giving it a try while I'm at it. Yeah, and there it is. You just have to do that in a roundabout way. So if you found, wanted to find all the words in Latin, while you have that window open, 
which is your word search um, window here, you would go to the second box over from the left, hit the arrow, scroll down, select Latin, and then hit the binoculars to the right for search. Now it's going to say you, it, it's going to tell you at the bottom that nothing came up. But what you want to do is, if you have your Latin module open over here, and I can, I can do it over here again, even though I could select from the wording in here. I just want to show you one more time. I selected the wording over here in my, my module. Make sure to click in it so you're, so that module is active. Select it, copy, go back here, select that text at the upper left, paste it in, enter. And look, I found this word, lucerent, in two verses in this form in the Latin Old Testament. And I could probably search for that. The one thing about Latin and Coin A is you could search for them in the New Testament too. I don't know if I'm going to find any. I didn't. So, cool tools that you can do a lot with. And um, if anyone's got some ideas on, on tricks or whatever that actually help with searching things out, let me know. Leave comments, send me emails, whatever. That would be great. Okay, so that's all I got for now. So until next time, um, take it easy.